Um, so welcome to the One Health seminar series. This series is organized by the University of Guelph One Health Institute. My name is Allison and I am a PhD student in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology and it is my pleasure to be facilitating the seminar today. Before we begin, I wanted to take some time to acknowledge that the University of Guelph, where we are hosting this seminar today, resides on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississauga of the Credit and on the ancestral lands of the Atawandron people. I also want to recognize that here, where we work and learn, is home to many past, present, and future First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And our acknowledgement of the land is a declaration of our collective responsibility to this place and its people's histories, rights, and presence, and reminds us of our relationship to this land where we explore, share, discuss, and learn about our shared responsibility for human, animal, plant, and ecosystem health. So before I introduce our speaker today, I wanted to inform everybody that the, the seminar will be recorded today. Um, this will be posted on the One Health YouTube channel and a link will be made available on the One Health Institute website. The recording may also be used by the One Health Institute in the context of promoting and showcasing One Health work where uh, being done on our campus. If you have any questions or concerns about the recording or One Health generally, you can contact one Health at uofguelph.ca and I can also put that in the chat so um, everyone has it on hand. And at the end of the seminar, I wanna let everybody know that there will be time for questions and discussion. So at that time, you can ask your questions by either raising your hand um, with the little hand raise uh, function. And when I invite you, you may ask your question or you can also type it in the, uh, in the chat and I can read it out loud. So without further ado, it is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Sherry Cox. Um, Sherry is a wildlife veterinarian and a medical director at the National Wildlife Center. She received her PhD, MBA, and DVM from the University of Guelph and is also a certified avian specialist with the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners. She's passionate about improving the health and welfare of sick animals while using a One Health approach. Sherry is now an assistant professor professor who joins us from Integrative Biology to speak about the role of wildlife rehabilitation in One Health. Welcome, Dr. Sherry Cox. Thanks very much, Allison. I'll just go ahead and share my screen. And hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to join here today and give a talk on, yes, something I am very passionate about, that's uh, wildlife rehabilitation and improving the health and welfare of our wildlife um, animals in Ontario and certainly across Canada and the world. Um, so I wanted just to start uh, by saying, you know, there are several uh, One Health issues that resonate with wildlife rehabilitation efforts, including new and emerging diseases, antimicrobial resistance, environmental contamination, and other health threats that are shared by people, animals, and the environment. And I'll highlight some of these in this talk. But first, a little, um, just a, a brief introduction about what is wildlife rehabilitation for anyone who's new to this field. Wildlife rehabilitation is um, providing temporary care for sick, injured, and orphaned wildlife with the goal of releasing them back into the natural environment where they can forage, reproduce, and behave like a normal wild animal of its own species. And that means sometimes if we can't do that, we do have to humanely euthanize these animals. And that's something that we teach wildlife rehabilitators when they take the basic skills courses right from the beginning, unfortunately, that euthanasia is a part of wildlife rehabilitation. So from that perspective, is it about the individual animal? Is it about conservation or is it about ecosystem health? And I would argue it could be all of the above. You know, everything is connected in our ecosystem. Every animal has a role in our ecosystem. So while in wildlife rehabilitation may look at that individual wild animal, we are also supporting conservation efforts as well as supporting ecosystem health. And these are some of the wildlife rehabilitators that I work with on a regular basis. So across Canada, there are many centers. Some are smaller centers, some are larger centers. Um, but every one of these centers um, looks at this from a One Health perspective in that they are talking to the public they on a daily basis they are helping animals and they are trying to get these animals back into the environment for which animals are part of the environment of course specifically in Ontario regulated on a provincial level uh, by the Ministry of Nat uh, Northern Development um, Mines Natural Resources and Forestry as well as Canadian Wildlife Service for migratory species like this commonly 
So we have different permits that we have to abide by. So in the role of wildlife rehabilitation in One Health, really wildlife rehabilitators seek to restore animal health and, and that's protecting the individual animals in those ecosystems. Wildlife rehabilitators uh, look to identify species at risk, uh, whether it's provincially or federally, and promote actions to support conservation efforts. And we look to advance um, the identification of zoonotic diseases and look for trends in illness or injury that we can pass back to other stakeholders. This is an example, just a few examples of how wildlife rehabilitators are embracing One Health, the One Health concept and communicating the important work that they do at the intersection of human animals and the environment. This happens to be uh, the Center for Rehabilitation of Wildlife down in Florida, Crow. Um, but there are others. This is the um, Raptor Center, which is out at the U uh, University of Minnesota. They uh, rehabilitate raptor species. And again, they're talking about the importance of One Health as well. The National Wildlife Center, uh, of which I'm affiliated here in Canada, again, one of the, the core components is the One Health concept. And here at the College, uh, in, sorry, at the College of Veterinary Medicine down at uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, they uh, on their website talk about wildlife rehabilitation and how important it is because every species has its role in the ecosystem, whether it's a prey animal like a rabbit or a squirrel for that hawk or a predator animal. And wildlife rehabilitation contributes to those efforts. There's actually a quite an interesting network system that has been created out of, um, it's a collaboration with UC Davis, US Fish and Wildlife, um, as well as uh, a wildlife uh, database organization. And they've created this network in order to identify trends, emerging trends um, for illness, uh, so morbidity and mortalities of wildlife. And, and the purpose of that is to respond to these trends uh, in a quicker way to um, reduce harm to wildlife and people in the environment. So they're using machine learning, computer science and epidemiology to look at trends in wildlife health. I think it's a great idea. Um, and certainly here in uh, Ontario and in Canada, we have hundreds of thousands of medical records. There is a, a free medical uh, record software that many wildlife rehabilitators use called WORMD, Wildlife Rehabilitation MD. And just as an example, the Hope for Wildlife Rehabilitation Center that I volunteer at in Nova Scotia, they have 7,500 patients a year contributing to this database. And that's only one center. Uh, Wild One happens to be another example of a, a database software. So we have lots of opportunities to, to mine data. So I think it's an untapped opportunity for uh, researchers for us to really look at trends um, and back to that network that UC Davis, US Fish and Wildlife are working on as well. I think it's something that wildlife rehabilitators here in Ontario and in Canada can play a vital, vital role. Focused, uh, my PhD was focused on patients admitted uh, to rehabilitation centers in Canada. And I looked at a retrospect, retrospective look of 21,000 medical records. And um, it, the results were up to 97% of wild animals brought into wildlife rehabilitation centers were thought to be directly or indirectly linked to anthropogenic causes. And so the vast majority uh, were trauma related um, as far as why animals were being admitted. So how else do rehabilitators interact with the public? Certainly um, diseases or illnesses, we see uh, unfortunately a lot of lead toxicity. In fact, we are working on a trumpeter swan tomorrow to try and remove lead from its ventriculus. Um, we're seeing a part of my research as well, looked at a survey of free ranging trumpeter swans um, brought into rehabilitation centers and those in the wild. And we found that 90% of swans have lead in them and one in five or 20% have levels that are consistent with what you would expect to see in clinical signs. And so this is very concerning that lead is a huge issue in the um, for animals in the environment and something that I think we're, we'll continue our research in this area. But aspergillosis is also another disease that we see that will be passing along information um, to uh, wildlife rehabilitators and uh, to scientists. Just one here. There we go. 
Other anthropogenic issues that we see that wildlife rehabilitators um, see when, when we think about animals, environment, and humans, uh, we run into this. Sometimes it's working at that intersection on a good end and not so good way. Certainly um, fishing, if we see um, the, you can appreciate this hook, and this is a common mechanzer. And for those of you who know the anatomy, this is the heart. And so this hook is dangerously close to that heart. And this is coming um, off a line that's here coming out of the, the uh, neck and out of the mouth of the bird. And the member of the public is the one who catches this bird, brings it to the rehab center. And what do you think they want to do with that fishing line when it's hanging out of the mouth? Of course, they want to pull. So um, th that would be detrimental, of course. So we work with the wildlife, wildlife rehabilitators and the public and restore the animal. So this animal did fine, had to have a surgery to remove that hook and then was released back into the wild. Or this adult bald eagle that um, hit a power line. So did it hit a power line as a primary cause of its fractured wing or was it secondary to something else? It did have low levels of lead toxicity in its system as well. Um, other reasons are uh, anthropogenic reasons that we come across certainly are um, uh, sh shot, like hunting, whether it's legal or illegal, hit by car. Um, in the case of these black bears that we released this summer, um, we had a lot of black bears this summer released, and that was quite concerning because we had an unusual um, sort of a several factors, negative factors from a climate perspective coming together at the same time. We had a very late frost here in southern Ontario in April which wiped out the blueberry crop, and that's what bears primarily eat in the late summer, um, combined with the LDD moth that wiped out um, most of the oak trees, or at least the leaves, and didn't allow them to um, present with some fruit. So acorns, they didn't have any acorns to eat either. And then the Northwest uh, region of Ontario had terrible forest fires up in Fort Francis and Kenora, much in Ontario. So it, we're, we're curious to see what that will do to the population next year. Um, but you know, we're looking at climate um, events anyway as having an impact on individual and populations of animals. And we did, the, uh, we did work with polar bears last December. Um, and this December, again, there was no ice in James Bay when there should have been ice. So typically when we see ice, and that means polar bears tend to wander down into communities in search of food. And we're seeing more and more of this, not just because of climate um, changes in climate. However, we're seeing it because of social media. People are seeing what's happening and they're posting it and they, they're demanding, I want something done. So people are, are engaging more with the environment and uh, with the animals and they want to help. This is an example of a snowy owl that um, was in rehabilitation and we repaired its uh, fractured wing and it did fine. Snowy owls are about to get released um, shortly to head back north. This trumpeter swan, it's an example of what we'll do again tomorrow, but this is, uh, these swans were at one time extirpated in Ontario, they didn't exist. And you know we're very concerned about the lead levels that we're seeing in these swans. Um, so this is a, on the right is a broken radius of a porcupine. So all these animals go into rehabilitation centers to, to get the help and then get restored uh, to health and then go back into the wild. Um, rehabilitators though also have uh, great data and great resources that they see firsthand what's happening. We were um, privy to an outbreak of West Nile virus and, and captive waterfowl at a rehabilitation center. We just noticed some birds dying very suddenly with some odd um, clinical signs, and it turned out to be West Nile virus. And what that meant was public health was called in to sample the water around that area um, because it was a public health risk and then warnings could go out um, to the general public. Similarly, um, algae blooms, so red tide, um, there's some surveillance going on with International Bird Rescue because it's not only making the birds sick, but it can make humans sick as well. Um, this is a recent publication with my colleagues at the University of Guelph um, over at OBC and AHL as far as bromethylene exposure. And this is a new neurotoxicant. And for me, this is very concerning as well because unlike the other rat poisons um, that would cause clotting factor disorders, so, so bleeding out, this one causes neurological issues. And so non-target species can um, eat this bait and there isn't a cure. So whether it's companion animals or other wildlife, um, or it could certainly be um, 
uh, children to playing or picking up, picking up this um, neurotoxicant. I'm not sure if you can appreciate this is um, this young bear came in, but it, he came in just from being flat. So he hadn't developed any neurological signs until the very yes. next day, because it takes a little bit for it to build up. In the I'm, I'm 16 years um, Sorry, I'll keep going. Um, also, rehabilitators uh, have a, an opportunity to report illegal hunting. And so this was a five kilogram uh, baby bear cub, basically, that was shot in the head and that's and it was not legal, at least at the time. Um, or we're working with the Canadian Wildlife Service to determine um, who shot this trumpeter swan, because again, that's not legal. So we can report that um, environmental pollution and, and events, catastrophic events, um, it was a shame because it was just six months prior to the Deepwater Horizon, these brown pelicans were taken off the endangered list, and then this event happened. Um, so, you know, also every year, though, the International Bird Rescue rehabilitates oil birds every year. And um, there, there have been lots of studies that show that rehabilitation efforts do support and help populations of animals. In particular, this is an example of the Rena oil spill, which is off New Zealand um, about 10 years ago. And they, uh, about a couple thousand birds did die, but they were able to successfully rescue close to 400 little blue penguins. Um, almost all of them were released. They had a 95% um, success rate. They also knew after the cargo ship um, tipped over, they knew the oil was coming to shore to a protected area where they were able to uh, a protected species before the oil hit shore and um, so preemptively save these birds. Um, the, the picture here is actually African penguins. Um, my volunteer work at um, Sand Cobb in South Africa, they get about a thousand penguins every year that come in oiled from mystery spills. Um, but certainly there are catastrophic events as well and, and one of the bigger spills, the treasure oil spill, uh, 20,000, close to 20,000 African penguins were rehabilitated, most of which were released and tracked and found to have um, successfully reproduced years later. And a recent study um, with the population level effects of wildlife, they looked at, you know, let's do some modeling. Does this even help? And the answer is yes, actually it does for some species, certainly turtles and bats. They looked at Blanding's turtles, snap, uh, common snapping turtles, uh, little brown bats, and they did find through their modeling that yes, um, they it can mitigate simulated extinction risks for these species. So certainly for some species, uh, wildlife rehabilitation has been shown to, um, to positively impact uh, populations. We also look at, you know, again, on the disease front, this was, um, an eastern fox snake that we had admitted and that lesion you see um, here was uh, snake fungal disease. Um, so, and these, these uh, fox snakes, these eastern fox snakes are endangered in Ontario, but we also see other emerging diseases like echinococcus. Uh, Dr. Scott Weiss's blog, I'm sure everyone is familiar with Dr. Weiss. Uh, it's, he has a great blog um, and I enjoy reading it. I know that there, there, he's posted recently, of course, with COVID and COVID-19 and different animals, in particular mustelids, when we think about the animals, uh, not just in mink fur farms, but we have mink that come into wildlife rehabilitation centers. Now, granted, they are not in high density populations, but they are uh, susceptible to, to uh, SARS-CoV-19. Uh, and so we do worry about both the health of our rehabilitators, but also of the animals, felids in particular. So we do rehabilitate bobcat, lynx, um, deer. And uh, so something that, you know, biosecurity and the importance of what are we seeing uh, in these populations of animals. Um, botulism, another example where wildlife rehabilitators were at the forefront of um, seeing this, this terrible botulism outbreak back in October. Um, because typically what happens is a member of the public will see these dead and dying birds. And if they're alive, they want to take the birds somewhere. And so many people took the birds to Shades of Hope um, Wildlife. It's a rehabilitation center in Pefferla, um, like this red-breasted merganser, but they also had um, surf scoters, they had long-tailed ducks, mallards, lots of different birds that they've rehabilitated and have been released. 
And of course, uh, avian influenza, highly pathogenic avian influenza. Now, several years ago, um, it was more you know, thought to be okay. It's probably endemic in wild ducks. Um, there was chickadee. So yes, it was um, prevalent. And then it was thought to be, well, LP, low path uh, avian influenza was endemic in the wild waterfowl. And a falconer um, had his falcon hunting, it caught a widgeon. The widgeon happened to be carrying LPAI and the falcon obviously died when it um, turned into HPAI in the falcon. And so he sent his bird in um, for a necropsy and it turned out to be HPAI. But in the meantime, he fed the rest of the widgeon to the rest of his falcons and of course they all died. So, you know, there was thought that raptors may be more susceptible than waterfowl. And more recently, you've probably heard about avian influenza, highly pathogenic avian influenza in Newfoundland. Um, there've been a couple of outbreaks there and it was thought, um, well, the first bird that they saw was from a park, um, the great black backed gull. And so we're watching this very carefully at the rehabilitation center in Atlantic Canada um, and setting in any birds that we think could uh, or are suspicious but that we don't know why they died or they have clinical signs that we can't, um, uh, can't really point to a diagnosis for. So in terms of migration, some of the thought here is that the flyways overlap in, um, in southern areas. So it, you know, the, the various flyways, you can see the different colors that represent the different flyways. You can see just the convergence here at the northern end. And there's thought that that's how perhaps some of um, this transmission is occurring. But the big threat right now is, of course, for the wild bird population, and, and that's based on the, the, the more recent highly pathogenic avian influenza out on the Atlantic side. Wildlife rehabilitators, though, they also work with regulators and law enforcement, whether it's with the ministry, whether it's with police services. Um, we get called out to help um, and then to transport animals um, back into wildlife rehabilitation centers as well. And if the rehabilitator doesn't respond, often the public tries to take it, uh, take it upon themselves to help that animal. So let's say a good example is an injured you know, baby raccoon and they can't find a rehabilitation center to take it, they may try and raise it themselves. And often that's um, to the detriment of the animal, of course. So we, we do play an important role. Uh, rehabilit rehabilitators work with each other and the community. So um, it is a tight knit group sharing information with each other so that we can help um, uh, really uh, em employ best practices from improving standards of animal care and animal welfare. Wildlife rehabilitators also train our students, both veterinary students, um, veterinary interns, so those who are vets, as well as wildlife biologists and others interested in this field. So this is an example of a wildlife um, biologist student, wildlife biology student, as well as a veterinary student. So again, training our students, this was uh, one of our interns as well. Um, and uh, this is uh, this particular picture here is um, a hog nose and a hog nose state, which is threatened in Ontario, this veterinary college. And she spent a lot of her time at the rehabilitation center uh, working with sick, injured and orphan wildlife. So opportunities to move forward. So, you know, what, what are some opportunities from a One Health perspective that we can look at? Certainly mitigation um, uh, and, and encouraging responsible angling, reporting illegal hunting and illegal activity and trade. So we want to, you know, how can we encourage anglers if uh, to, to maybe think about non-toxic use of um, fishing uh, equipment or even shot for that perspective? We can look at, as well at improving animal welfare, um, both for the individual animals um, in our care. We can continue to prevent disease and restore health. In this picture on the left, it's a microscope, microscopic view of a granuloma that I took out of a, 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 a Canada goose that had, those are all hyphae from aspergillosis. And so how do we reduce um, disease or prevent disease, uh, both uh, while in, in care um, but also how, how do we look at making sure we're putting out healthy animals um, and animal welfare. This is an example on the right of just a fractured mandible on a barred owl that we were able to repair. Um, it rehabilitated and it was successfully released back into the wild. Um, and again, rehabilitators uh, restore health. So we want to keep supporting wildlife rehabilitation efforts to help these animals. Um, 
So this is an example of a, a black bear that um, you know, dispersed from its mom when it normally does around 18 months of age and wandered uh, down some green space into a southwestern urban center and was sanction. Unfortunately, it was shot by police. Um, and by the time we were able to respond and get it back into rehabilitation, we had to deal with that wound that it eventually did get released. I won't go through and play the video, but if we have time, I'm happy to, to do that after if it's released, but it did well. Um, and so, you know, certainly we, we rehabilitators, we, do, we see everything from moose to mice, turns to trumpeters, wands, uh, wildlife rehabilitators, we, we treat them all like this example of the cedar wax, wax wing. So not just opportunities, but actions moving forward in a One Health framework. Um, you know, encouraging more rehabilitation efforts to restore health to wildlife, because again, they play such an important part. Every animal plays an important part in our ecosystem, whether it's a prey animal or a predator animal. We can provide data. Let's share information across disciplines. Um, just on the rehabilitation side, the, Nor uh, the National Wildlife Rehabilitators Association Symposium, the International Wildlife Rehabilitation Council, um, and Endelberry both have journals um, that we can share information. But you know, we can look at whether it's from public health perspectives, whether it's from, um, you know, biology population management perspectives, infectious disease, we can come together because we have so much information uh, at, at the forefront of wildlife rehabilitation that's really untapped. We have an opportunity to engage with more wildlife rehabilitators to collect these data on zoonotic, zoonotic pathogens and, and endangered species. And is there an opportunity to create something similar here in Ontario through the One Health Network on the wildlife morbidity and mortality event, like what UC Davis and US Fish and Wildlife have done in conjunction with the wildlife rehabilitators? So One Health, you know, as, as we know, it's we're all connected and it's all we're all part of the same shared environment. And wildlife rehabilitation does sit really at that intersection of humans, animals, and environment. So we like to say, you know, healthy ecosystems, it's the same as healthy animals, healthy people, because we are all, we are all connected. Um, and this final picture is just of some um, African penguin chicks and then the adult African penguins uh, in rehabilitation just before they were released. So with that, I will stop and I'll stop sharing my screen and see if there are any questions. Thank you very much, Sherry. That was awesome and super informative. It was interesting to see. It's completely different than like my uh, realm of study. So it was interesting to hear that different perspective as someone who does love animals.